Hello, and welcome to Harder Than It Looks, Parking Uncovered, a podcast to facilitate connections and illuminate real solutions to common problems within the parking and mobility industry. I'm Brian Wolf, President and CEO of Parker Technology, and I'll be your host as we speak with parking professionals from across the industry at all levels to uncover tips, tricks, and best practices to manage what we all know is harder than it looks, parking a car. On the show today is Don Charlie, Assistant Vice President of Parking Service Line for the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center's hospital division consisting of 40 hospitals. So Don has over 40 years of experience in healthcare support services management, primarily in parking and security services. Don boasts extensive experience in merging multi-hospital support service operations into integrated and consolidated systems. One of his career highlights was the establishment of the UPMC Security Police Canine Program in 2015. This was an innovative and unique approach to improving and strengthening hospital security. UPMC is the only healthcare system in the Commonwealth to deploy specially trained canine units as part of its hospital-based security police team. He's received a variety of awards, including PPA's Award of Excellence for Parking Operations. He was a finalist for Campus Safety's Director of the Year, one of Pittsburgh's Tribune Reviews, who's who at Newsmaker, as well as being published in various trade journals and presenting at several industry conferences. Today on the show, we're going to cover thriving personally and professionally in an environment that is always changing, the challenges of managing a diverse group of parking customers in a healthcare environment, and making parking personal when protecting privacy privacy in a digital world is the highest priority. Don, welcome to... Harder than it looks, parking uncovered. How are you today? I'm well, Brian. Thank you. It's an honor to be joining you today. It's an honor to have you. And as I reread that bio, and I read it a couple of different times, I, I can tell you that y- you are quite accomplished in, in those 40 years. That's quite amazing. You've, you've had an illustrious career, so I- I'm honored that you'd join me. Oh, thank you. I, I appreciate the kind words. What I like to do to kick things off, because I'm a big fan of hearing people's stories, because I think you can learn a lot about the people as they tell their story about the choices they made and the different directions they went. What I'd like to do is, by way of introduction, is just hand you the microphone, go back as far as you'd like to go, and just tell us your story, how you went from one place to the other, or how you got one job and the other job and all of that. Just take us through your story. Oh, sure, we'll do. Thank you. My story starts back in September 9th of 1981 uh, when I joined the UPMC. It was my first job out of college. My, my undergrad's from Penn State in health planning and administration. The first job I had at the UPMC was as a security officer in our psychiatric facility. It was basically the only job I could find as a new grad working in healthcare. So I was uh, pleased to have it and we uh, I did that for about a year and then in the I worked the evening shift and I would this one female administrator would call for an escort to her car to, to the parking garage routinely and I would take that call and I got to know her and one day I just introduced myself a little bit more to her my background and well, I don't mind what I'm doing I certainly would like to do something different if she had anything in her area I would appreciate it and then about a week later, she called and had an opportunity in one of her areas. So I was able to take that opportunity. <clears throat> and then that was in our, like our community mental health programming as an administrative assistant there. Did that for about two years and got recruited still within Western in our psychiatric facility to be a assistant in support services. So I did that. And within about three years, I, w- I became the administrator over support services and was interesting at that time because the gentleman that was my boss when I was a security officer, I ended up in three years being his boss and that was a unique relationship. That was quite a learning relationship for me as a young manager. There's uh, a story there, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> yes. Uh, but then the, uh, my first 10 years of my career were at our psychiatric facility. I, I always tell a quick funny story. My mother, when she was with her uh, friends. They, as mothers do, they talk about their children. And 
I have two older brothers, and they would ask my mom, what's David, your oldest, doing? And she would say, and then she'd say, Doug, my middle one's this. And then she would always say, then Don, my youngest, is at Western Psych, our psychiatric hospital. And they would always look at her like, oh, I'm sorry. So one day she finally said, is that not, not a good place to work? And I'm like, well, what are you talking about, Mom? She goes, when I tell them, my friends, you're at Western Psych, they all act really sad. And I said, Mom, that's because you're presenting like I'm a patient there. <laughs> but I, you see, you need to say I work there, not that I'm at. Anyway, quick funny story about that. That's um, hilarious. <laughs> but the first 10 years were at our psychiatric facility. At that point in time, we started as an organization forming what first be, became known as the Medical and Healthcare Division of the University of Pittsburgh. And from the leadership of Western Psych, which was somewhat unprecedented that Dr. Thomas Detry, as a psychiatrist, became the leading physician in the academic medical center of the University of Pittsburgh. But he had a vision of formulating the Medical and Healthcare Division. We had merged with several local hospitals. First was Ioneer Hospital, then the Falk Clinic Outpatient Building, and then Presby Hospital. And through all of those mergers, opportunity came as my vice, my per person I reported to gained more responsibility. I picked right. up more of his responsibilities. So that t takes us through about the mid nineties. And then I always yeah. had an opportunity to manage security parking always tagged with it something else, usually like environmental health and safety. Or Then in the mid-90s, I had an opportunity to be the director of maintenance and housekeeping services for University of, or for Presbyterian Hospital University and Montefiore Hospital University. There was a lot of issues and controversies swirling with the previous management. And my, my boss at the time thought my management style was the right thing to go in and calm it down. And, and I'll never forget, because then he, he said, uh, Donald, unless you stumble horribly, you know, we're merging with Shadyside Hospital probably within a year and a half. There could be something there for you. And so uh, I'll never forget that conversation. But um, yeah, so, you know, did that. And then we merged with Shadyside and picked up uh, security and parking at Shadyside as well. It's a hospital about a mile away from our flagship hospital, Presbyterian. Um, towards the end of the 90s, early 2000s, we picked up Mon or McGee Hospital, McGee Women's Hospital. And just, just careers kept evolving through different mergers, acquisitions, but always staying within primarily parking and security as we right. brought new facilities on board. So, so that, that, my whole career has been at the UPMC been very blessed to be able to build a good career and not have to change employers. I've got a lot of varied experience. Also got my master's along the way from the University of Pittsburgh in health or in public administration and been very blessed in a lot of ways. Yeah. Wow. What it, so you're filling in a lot of blanks for me. So selfishly, this has been really good because as we talk about all of the campuses, Presby and Shadyside and Women's Health and all of that, I can now see it all being drawn into the vortex that is UPMC, which is really quite cool. It's good. I, I appreciate the history lesson. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. No worries. The, yeah. um, the other thing that strikes me, so first I have to back up and say, so David, Doug, and Don, uh, I happen to be in a family that was the killer bees. It was Barb, Bruce, Brian, Brooke. So nice. I can totally relate to the the killer D's and the killer B's. That's very fun. <laughs> and I can imagine if your mom was like my mom, she struggled to get the right D out when she was upset. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that's that's so fun. All right. And so then the other thing and, and this so to me, this is the essence of the podcast, because we can talk about your history and that's interesting. But I want people listening to get practical tips and tricks to, to building a great career. And what I heard really clearly is you didn't start out in parking. That's probably true for most people. But it was obvious that you did a great job and that you got pulled along by a boss that really thought you were, that you were doing a good job. He trusted you. And you know, as people build their careers, in, whether it's in parking or anywhere else, one of the keys I found is to be able to do a great job where you are. It may not be the perfect job, but to do a great job where you are. And then invariably, if your boss 
moves on, they're going, if you've done a good job for them, they're going to pull you along. And I think that's a, it's a great story. It, it's a testament to the work that you've done and the fact that people really enjoyed working with you. And then the pearl that I'm interested to dive into, what he thought about your management style as you went into, I think it was the, was it the mental health stint that it was 10 years where he, he pulled you aside and, and said, I think you're man. Oh no, it was the maintenance services. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm fumbling that up, but I, I want to hear what it was about your particular style that he thought was a good fit. And then once you got there, do you agree? And how did that all turn out? Sure. Yeah, I, to echo your point, my, my philosophy has always been, I've tried to my very best to bloom where I'm planted. And I love that. Whatever, whatever came my way, I was willing to, to do, willing to strive to do to the best of my ability. And so I, I think that helped establish a reputation that, that preceded me forward as well. And to the question of my style, I think it's not a authoritative style at all. It's more of a collaborative, participative style, um, uh, one that listens to uh, your employees, more of a servant leadership aspect to it, if you will. I always me. I love it, that. <laughs> I always considered myself the, the least important in the organization and support those who are actually doing the work that where whatever they need. We what I still remember the first time when I met with the housekeeping staff at UPMC Presby. Great people. There was about 270 people and, and myself. And there was still a lot of leftover animosity from the previous management of that department for various and sundry, sundry reasons that sure. I won't delve into, but it, it, it had not fostered a good relationship. So at the end, throughout that meeting, we just let them vent and said, folks, I can't go back and change the past and what you experienced. I pledge you, I'll work with you and move forward and we'll create a different experience for you all. And so, you know, just being upfront, transparent, and then after, that was the probably the only time I had everybody together at one time. Okay. After that, I broke everybody up into smaller groups by their work areas. And I, I would meet with each one of those work areas weekly and just ask, what do you need to do your job? What equipment do you need? What, what have you been wanting? What can I do? And they had the Nike approach, just do it. If it was right. something simple they needed, we just did it. We went and bought it or acquired it or changed it or whatever. And just re really over over a little bit of time just reestablish the trust between our frontline employees and management yeah so that's really interesting so i don't want to delve into the past and what came before you in maintenance services but i would like to create contrast because what i'm hearing from you is that first you you created smaller units that probably made sense so somebody had glued together an organization that didn't make sense so you broke it apart which i find fascinating but then uh, the other thing, the other piece that I heard was that you were intimately involved. You, you, you actually walked the place and got involved with these folks. Absolutely. I can imagine I could tell myself a story that the person who had your job before probably spent more time behind a desk than they did in the actual units talking to the people. And again, I, my experience has been that leaders, servant leaders in particular, I have a very soft spot for servant leadership get involved, right? They need to know that their people have their back. Maybe just say a little bit more about how that came about and what led you to that conclusion. Sure. I, I think part of it is just listening, right? Just taking the time to listen to what people's frustrations were, what their angst was, what they felt they needed to do a good job. Everybody wanted to do a good job. I always start from that premise and how, how can I help them do that good job or do a good job better? And so we investing the time and listening. I'll tell you one, one story, right? So they, the previous administration had a very draconian way of administering discipline. And there was this, as I took over, there was one supervisor that was on the brink of discipline for something that when I looked at it, I didn't think it was that significant. I was meeting with her and she's, she was upset and said, this happened under so-and-so, but what's going to happen now? It hasn't been. And I, I listened and listened and, and I could tell that she was the, the earnest of which she was presenting her case. I looked at, I was listening and then I, I picked up the, the written warning, whatever. And I said, this is what I'm going to do about it. And I just ripped it up in front of her and said, it doesn't exist. And we're going to move forward with a clean slate. And she was just blown away. Yeah. 
that uh, that I listened, that I demonstrated caring and compassion and what happened. Yeah. Yeah. You know, again, so it's funny. I, I was thinking to myself, I hope he rips it up. I'm like, I'm listening, like, like I'm watching a movie, right? Yeah, that was, right? What a great story. I knew that we would lead to good stories. So thank you for that. Sure. But just imagine the amount of trust that you built in that moment, because you could see that person's heart. You could see that she was trying to do a good job. Absolutely. And the previous administration was micromanaging, was nitpicking, and just being probably, frankly, bullies, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, that yeah. was the, the essence of what had transpired before my taking over that area. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, so now I, I'll, I'll go two steps back to your boss who said, sure. okay, so he observed your work. You were obviously managing people before that, before he moved you over to maintenance. You, you had a bunch of people reporting and he saw your style and he's, I need a little of Don Charlie magic over in maintenance and facilities. Yeah. It's a great story. And uh, again, just under, uh, it just underscores that if you do a great job where you are, you're, you're going to get noticed and people are going to, they're going to, they're going to pull you along in their rise to fame. And then you get to do the same thing. I'm sure you've got stories of people that you've pulled along as well. Oh, sure. And, and the, the one thing that really brought home to me in terms of my management career is you don't have to be an expert in something to be able to manage it. If you listen to the people that you have in place and make the assessment that they're talented and yeah. they understand their business, I, I don't need to be a, an expert in HVAC or an electrician or what have you. I know how to manage, I know how to work a budget, I know how to adult, set the stage. Yep. But but my goal is to let people do what they do. So yeah, that's to, fantastic. To stay out of their way as much as Get out of their way. Do. That's exactly right. So you share that vision or that trait with Jack Welch. I'll, I'll never forget it. I probably read straight from the gut 30 years ago. Wow. And w one of the things that he said that just really impressed me, and I've tried to apply it, and in fact, I have applied it actually to, to Parker, is he, he would he would take his best managers, just like your boss did, and he would plop them into business units that they had no idea what they what they were doing. So I, I don't remember the names, but he dumped one of his guys from GE into, they had just bought NBC Universal. And the line that he said was your line. He's that guy didn't know a thing about broadcasting, but he was a great manager and he would figure it out through his people. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, that's just an awesome, it's a great story, but it is, it's true. You don't need to be the expert. What you need to be able to do is help people see how to, how to get through it, have a vision for a standard that you want to get, that you want to create, and then just go get things done. The other thing that I heard you say before that I love, and that is even UPMC is a huge organization and it probably was a huge organization. There were 270 people and you would walk up and, and say, okay, if something needed to be done, we just got it done. Yeah. Right. If people needed resources, we, we're just going to go find the resources. And of course, you, you can never sometimes there are ceilings to those resources, of course. But just the act of listening to what they need and getting it done is so powerful. It's it's a great piece of the story. Yeah, I, I've, I've lifted that term from Nike. Just do it. Yeah, that's it. Just do it. You, know. you are you may be foreshadowing the lightning round but you may have other you may have other phrases that, uh, that you want to talk about so let me let me transition because you're going to tell other stories let me, let me transition and and talk about your experience as you were consolidating these support services so you you made a point of putting that in your bio that you had done a lot of that consolidation mm -hmm. so tell me it, it's hard to do what, what were the keys in your mind to figuring out who to consolidate, how to consolidate it, and then how to have success. We got we heard a little bit about it, it through your management style, but like, tell me, I want to sure. hear stories about consolidating operations because to me, I have found lots of times whether it's companies acquiring other companies or it's consolidation, it always is ripe with disaster. Frankly, oh yeah, absolutely, and. Some of it, quite frankly, was trial and error over the course of time because okay. when we build our hospital division, 40 hospitals are, are a lot to bring in. But I, what I've learned is I, I, I have to be able to distinguish between what's my preference and what's a requirement and uh, on that consolidation and on when we look to do that. And so we try to make things, I've always tried to make things uh, when we consolidate more from the 
and in healthcare particularly, more from the perspective of the patient, right? So wow. if we have three or four hospitals in um, in Pittsburgh and what we call our urban core, we, we want certain things to be somewhat similar to the patient, right? Like our rate structures and equipment, like a general branding of part. Yeah. But yep. then you got to have enough flexibility to allow the, the specific institutions to do what's best for their institution. It could be geography limitations, budget limitations, or what have you. So you know, my, my goal always was to be try to set a certain level of standard that makes sense from a patient perspective, but yet at the same time, be able to have enough flexibility to have that institutional uniqueness, be able to be recognized and come through. And to realize that I'm in more of a help situ- helper situation at that point. Right. Yeah. Uh, when I would meet with the various VP of operations and, and their leadership, it's like, I'm, I'm not here to have everybody be a cookie cutter of everything. Yeah, there are certain things we want to have, certain across the board standards. You're going to run your own shop. I'm here to help. I'm here to advise. I'm here to be an internal consultant, however you want to use me. I'm not going to tell you how to run your day to day. Um, right. And it, it took a while for me to be comfortable with that. <laughs> In the beginning, we were, it was a little bit more, wanted everything to be so similarly structured. And yes. learned that really wasn't the right way to go about it because it, it just got a lot of pushback. And then yeah. the other thing that happened, we many of our 40 hospitals are not in a heavily urban setting like the city of Pittsburgh. They, they have the luxury of land and don't need to charge for parking. And they're always like, oh, Pitt, you're going to make us charge for parking, aren't you? You're going to make our employees pay. Said, no, no, not at all. If it works. If it's working for you, that's fine. Right. Yeah. Said, if you choose to want them to pay, I'm here to help how we structure it, what we need to do. But it's your decision. It's not mine. So it's trying to reach that blend of, as I said, what's a requirement and what's a preference. And yeah, I love that. Distinguish it. A requirement versus a, a preference. I, I will carry that with me a long time. So I appreciate <laughs> that pearl for sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Requirement versus preference. You, you gave some flexibility, but I, I heard along the way, I went back to trial and error, right? Initially, it makes perfect sense to me. If I walk into a UPMC in downtown Pittsburgh, or I walk in in Cleveland, some level of uniformity, I think probably helps calm people down. They, they feel like it's a familiar place. Right. But it's, it also sounds as you were trying to standardize things, there were probably local vendors in the way around things that got sold and people's preferences for tools that they used and things like that. That probably got a little bit hard. It did. It did. And that, that's where you learn. You got to make that determination. Is it my preference or is it my requirement? You know? Yeah. If it's yep. a preference, then I, I have a lot more latitude re- regarding what's my preference versus right. what's going to be right for that individual facility or, or what have you. So, ah, that, I, I love that. Okay, so now I'm, I am dying to hear how you used your management style to manage all of the big and really big and small personalities in parking or on the campus because you're dealing with really sick patients Mm -hmm. but you're also dealing with really confident physicians who are treating those patients Mm -hmm. and then probably really confident administrators who believe that they've got an awesome machine and sometimes you may you probably had to tell them that their baby was ugly or that they they were not nearly as special so i'd like to hear stories and pearls of wisdom around how you developed a style that could manage that diverse population of parking constituents. Sure. Thank you. Part of that style really was born in my security experience. Okay. By that, the way that I, the way that I approached my security and I also did security UPMC police for 30 years and along with parking, but in the security area, I, I broke it down that we have three main constituent groups, our patients and visitors. And when we deal with patients and visitors, we are, we tend to be more of a, a land of second, third, fourth chances, right? Of trying okay. to have behavior become into compliance or something towards that, right? And nobody's at their best when they're a patient and, or you have a loved one in the hospital, it's a lot of stress. 
and you have to have that realization of that. We have, so that, that was one big constituent group. Yeah. The next is our employees, right? And with our employees, a lot of things were dealt with more an administrative process. If, if somebody may have stolen something that was small, relatively insignificant, we weren't looking to arrest them. We dealt with that through an administrative HR process and handled that. And then the third constituent group, or what I, for lack of a better term, what I end up calling non-business invitees that <laughs> enter our facilities. And, uh, non-business invitees. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> for that, we would generally take more of a, a stringent security police posture in dealing with them. So I took that concept and lifted it out of security and tried to put it into parking because it was familiar to me. Yeah. Particularly in healthcare, our, our first and foremost priority are our patients yep. and, and visitors. Uh, not only is it you know the right ethical thing to do, but as our, as our CFOs would say, no margin, no mission. We have to take care of our patients and, and make sure that we do everything we can for them. And that we're in a, and we are a land of second, third, fourth chances. If somebody's not parking in the right area, we don't. We just tried some an educational approach. Next time, please park over here, kind of thing. Or we see a lot of it in our valet service too, where I have empowered every one of our employees. If you're a valet, work administratively in our parking office, they have the power to comp somebody's parking. If they run into a situation and hear a compelling story, hear a compelling tell of what somebody's gone through, yeah, and if right. they feel it, it's the right thing to do, just comp their parking. That five, six, seven dollars isn't gonna break the UPMC, but it's gonna create a, a patient and that will continue to come to the UPMC for their health care. Yeah. We try to always structure it, Every, everything's for the patient. In terms of when we deal with our employee base, we've tried to align our parking to support our book of business, right? We have on-site parking, near-site, off-site. On-site parking is obviously patients, visitors, physicians with admitting privileges, senior executive staff, sometimes, sometimes difficult to recruit for positions like CRNAs, things of that nature. We try to align that to best support our book of business. Near-site is primarily our nursing staff. That's generally within a, a block, two blocks of the hospital that they're working at. And then offsite, we have a lot of large offsite population, and it's a lot of administrative staff, support staff that have to take a 15, 20 minute shuttle ride. Now, w within that, there's always a lot of jockeying. And what I try to. <laughs> <laughs> jockeying, is that what you're calling it? <laughs> Everybody wants to park under their desk, which isn't always possible, but obviously. But I try to always instruct our staff, these are our guidelines, but right. they have to be flexible. You have to listen, you have to be in tune. Oh, it, it may be like I'm a physician assistant, which is very a strong position in healthcare, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah, we say physicians with admitting privileges, but yes, we will extend on-site parking to a physician assistant because they're actually doing a lot of the physician's patient care activities. Sure. Well, yeah. That they're working for. So it's, we try to have these try to set it as guidelines and it's not always a strict protocol how you're going to be able to do it so it's yeah. what i call part science part art we what we do yeah. is part science in terms of space allocations what we can do and the art part is how you blend that and manage it and we are we are set up overall as a matrix organization because our founders of the upmc and realize that's the best way to recruit and retain top scientific talent because within a matrix organization the boundaries aren't always very clear right you bring top scientific talent in they can push that boundary they can shape it and do things and move and what have you and that makes it difficult on operations right so part of what i've learned over the years is who do i have to listen to the strongest when i'm dealing with who thinks they're first among equals <laughs> You start to develop that sense of, uh, yeah, I just, I'm going to tune in over here a little bit more and not to tune, and tune this out a little bit more. And then w within the matrix organization, there's all, there's a lot of gray, right? And yep. that gray yeah. is intended to be there so people can shape it and make it yeah. something right and maneuver. And from the support end, I always 
said that you got to learn to play in the gray. And you can use it to your advantage or, or if there's a situation, just the top scientific talent. Oh, I'd like to get out in front of that. I'd like to be more involved in that. Or if your spider sense is tingle and it's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shrink back a little bit more in the shadows and let that one pass me by and see. A lot of that just comes from trial and error, trying to, trying to be, that's the thing I like about the UPMC. Even after almost 43 years, I feel I leave every day better than I started. I've learned something new. It could be as simple as a, a new word I've never been exposed to that I've heard yep. someone say, or new concepts, new ideas, whatever. But it, it's a constant learning environment, and, and I appreciate that. So. Yeah, that is that is awesome. I, I understand how you've managed to – how many different bosses have you, do you suppose you've had in 43 years, Don? Well, geez, probably about 10 or 12. Yeah. It, I understand why every one of your bosses loved you, right? Because – you clearly got a clear handle on the requirements early on, and then you just worked in the gray to make everything else work, Absolutely. which is really impressive. There, there are people that would strive to have the, the touch that you have and the command that you have of the difference between the two. I think that is the pearl of your career, actually. Thank you. I appreciate that. And it's hard for some people. Some people want more structure. Yes. They, and they want more of a hierarchical structure and like they, they have a hard time understanding why somebody they think is way removed is having influence on what we do when they're not in our immediate chain of command, if you will. Yeah. But that's the whole matrix thing, right? Where yep. you got to have that fluidity, that nimbleness of mind and management approach. Anyway. Yeah. So that's really good. All right. What I'd like to do now is I've got a handful of what we call lightning round questions. I'm sure they'll lead to, to more stories. But I, I'd like to roll through these and, and then ask you to give me your thoughts on each one of them. So if there's a phrase that someone else in the organization utters and the person talking to them says, oh, that, that is Don Charlie. That's quintessential Don Charlie. Your trial and error, anybody inside of Parker, if they hear experiments never fail, they absolutely know that the origin of that phrase was Brian Wolf. So right, right. if somebody at UPMC utters a phrase and the person receiving it says, that's Don Charlie, what is the phrase? Do you have a, do you have a phrase that you're famous for or several? I, you can tell I, more I, than I one. I have several. I bet you do. <laughs> One is parking's more than two white lines on pavement. Yes. <laughs> the other is anytime, and this is based on my experience in healthcare, anytime somebody starts a sentence with you, a nurse said there's a beating coming, just get ready for it. It's going to happen. <laughs> and just let it roll off your back. So that, that, and then the other one is we either win or we learn. And so those would be probably the three. We either win or we learn. And anytime a nurse says a nurse said, that there's trouble. There's oh, yeah. trouble Any, coming. Absolutely. Anytime you hear a nurse said that there's a beating coming for you, some <laughs> oh way, somehow. So. That's priceless. All right. So the second question is, what's the hardest thing you've ever done in your life? Not just parking. Parking will be next. But what's the hardest thing you've ever done in your life? Oh, boy. I think rebound from my father's passing. He passed mm -hmm. when I was 19. And just coming through on the other side of that yeah. in a good way. He was very influential to me. And he passed when I was in college, so he never got to see me graduate, never mm -hmm. saw me get married, never met his granddaughter, those kind of things. And yeah. just working through all of that and being able to come to kind of peace with it. And it was probably the hardest personal, one of the hardest personal things. Yeah. And um, wow. my father was my high school principal, by the way. And one of my fondest memories is when I graduated from high school, he handed me my diploma. And then I just reached out and gave him a hug and they had a, took a picture of that. And so that, that's one of my fondest wow. memories of yeah. when I think back. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. So I, I lost my dad two years ago and I can't imagine losing, having lost him at 19. That would be really hard. Yeah, it felt adrift for a while. Yeah. But you found your way. 
that yes. if nothing else, there's th- that's the rest of the story, right? Yes, the rest sir. of the story is it's okay to drift sometimes. Yeah, you got to yeah. work your way through it for sure. Yeah, not all who wander are lost. It, it's <laughs> not all who wander are lost. I love it. I love that. Okay, all right. So then, what do you think the hardest thing about your parking job is? What's the hardest thing? I, is managing the competing and disparate elements of it, right? The, be, because institutional parking is so much different than other, the other aspects of professional parking. As a private operator, it's different. Right. Um, as a, a vendor of parking services, it's different. But institutional parking has so many different challenges because you're, you have your... As I said, you have your various constituent groups that are always there, that you always are dealing with. And and, and, I'm, and I'll say this, when you deal with physicians, I got to keep, I try to keep in the back of my mind that some are terrific people, right? Right. They're just really terrific people. But some also are, have a, can come across with a sense of entitlement and, and what have you. But I always try to keep in the back of my mind these are the people that are fixing God's mistakes. They have a little bit of, try to give them a little bit wide berth on attitude and right. not react to that. Try to get past that and listen to what their need is and try to help them. Because we are there to serve. We are there to make things happen, yeah. and create things. And so I think that's one of the hardest things. And it's in managing and trying to manage equitably a, a limited resource. Um, and that, that's why I say it's part science and part art. Part art, uh, yeah. How you manage that. And I, I had one story that I'll share if you don't mind. No, I would love it. Um, Please. As, as we all know, in, in parking, your, your garages can fill on certain days. And yeah. when that happens, we divert incoming traffic. And um, I had a physician one time get very angry because we diverted his parking that day to another garage. And it wasn't far. It was a garage that we had basically across the street. He was uh, expressing his displeasure, and I just calmly asked him, I said, doctor, help me understand. Every day, it happens within the walls of the hospital where patients get admitted off service. You have a cardiac patient, cardiac beds are full, they may end up going on a general medicine unit. I said, how is it so much worse I do that with a piece of metal? when we do that with human beings and patients every day here <laughs> and and i think that just really grabbed him in terms of perspective yep and and that ended the conversation in, in a good way but <laughs> it's just it's those kind of things right yep. where where you have to get help people gain that perspective of what we're doing or why can't you park in this area because that's for patients so if you, right without a patient neither you or i get a paycheck so we yeah we have to have our patient park here and so those are the kind of things what i love about that is part of my secret ambition here is to make these podcasts interesting enough for non-parking people to listen to them so that they can truly have some perspective about how hard parking is Right. And they're thinking about it, about putting a car between two lines. And what you've done over the past 45 minutes is describe the managing a scarce resource under a micros- microscope under pressure. Absolutely. And they don't see any of that. They don't have any of that perspective. And if I could have, if I could do one thing in my life, at least while I'm in parking, is to help people, non-parking people understand that this is a really hard thing to do and they should have a little more compassion for the people that are working in those parking garages. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. I totally am on, on board with your with your aspiral ac- action with that because it is very true. Everybody thinks, how hard can it be? How hard can it be? <laughs> and there's so many facets to it. And yep. there's a, facets of just basic space limitations, Yep. Uh, there's so much of a political aspect to it, both internal and external. Everybody thinks, you'll just go build a garage. No. Where, first where, of all. For one thing, and then, <laughs> you know, we're, a lot of urban areas are now are becoming somewhat parking unfriendly. They, they, are, they want people to bike and alternate commute and different things. 
they're not really readily available to approve new garages and different things. And there's just a whole, there's just so many different aspects to it. And uh, that's part of what I enjoy about it. Uh, yes. But, I can tell you're a man that, that thrives in complexity for sure. Okay. So my next question is if you could wave a magic wand and fix one thing about parking, what would it be? Wow. I think it would be to have the ability for people to be able to always have a, the parking space that they would like to have when they want it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now that's going to take, that will take a genie. Oh yeah. I know. But it would be uh, ideal if, in, if we were able to do that, either that or create some kind of shrink gun that, as the vehicles enter the garage, we could shrink them down like matchbox cars and <laughs> store them that way. But, uh, <laughs> so they could park under their desk. I love that, too. I yes. heard that phrase. Everybody wants to park under their desk. <laughs> that Absolutely. is hysterical. <laughs> oh, that's good. All right. So when you're not parking cars, what do you do for fun? Oh, I like to be able to uh, be outside, you know, like to, sometimes like to swing a golf club, though I'm not very good. Sometimes just I like to uh, lift weights a lot, things like that. And uh, I don't know, I've always been good at pushing heavy things. Interesting. And just just take life as it comes. Yeah. I love, love to spend time with my daughter. Uh, she lives in Iowa. And um, so I try to get out there as much as I can. Um, and she went to Purdue. I know your, your son went to Purdue. Boiler up. Yeah, and, that's uh, awesome. Yeah, and then she stayed out in the Midwest, you know, those kind of things. So, yeah, I mean, try to have enough to keep me busy. That's fantastic. So I have a, an Iowa connection, too, and you've told me. Is she in Des Moines? Is that where she is? She's in Ames now. I, I, I was going to guess Ames, and I defaulted yeah. to Des Moines. Yeah, so boiler up and then the Iowa where pigs outnumber people, yeah. three or four to one. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Iowa's a great state, but as I was recruiting out there, it was a little harder and I couldn't hire pigs. All right, so this is the last question, and this will probably help us wrap up the entire segment. As you look back, what are you most proud of, Don? What, what gives you the most pride? Well, several things, actually. One is creating the canine unit for our hospital place. It was a novel idea. It was born out of a tragic situation we had in our mm. psychiatric facility two years prior to that in 2013, where we had an active shooter incident. And, and the, because my career started at that psychiatric facility, it's always held a, a, a very close spot in my heart. And uh, yep. we were looking for way, non-lethal ways of improving our security and police posture. Right. And I, it was funny because when I first presented it to our executive committee, they, they all looked at me like I had three heads. But I, I got our um, VP of nursing and our VP of physician relations on board. And we, finally, we were able to get it um, approved. Our hospital president at the time approved it, but gave me no funding. So <laughs> I had to go and cobble the funding together. And I applied to the Steelers quarterback, Ben Roethlisberger, had a, has a foundation that he supports canine units for oh. police departments in cities that the Steelers play in. I, I appealed, sent an application into his foundation, got $10,000 from his foundation, talked to Our Lady's Hospital Aid Society, got $20,000 from them, um, got another 20000 from another fund, so foundation. But I was able to cobble the money together, which he was just, he didn't know what to do at that point in time. Um, <laughs> he thought he'd killed it, didn't he? Yeah. He didn't know Don Charlie, though. No, no, we, we were on a mission. And so anyway, bi really building that, that program from the ground up and doing it right. We, I hired a master trainer that just retired from Pennsylvania State Police. We went and bought extremely high-quality canines from a breeder that specializes in police dogs they were like olympic athletes they, they, these dogs are just amazing yeah those dogs are amazing for sure and just the whole thing and starting it from ground zero and bringing it to fruition and the canines are like the rock stars of the hospital everybody loves to see them for the most part but no but make no mistake that they'll take care of business if needed yeah. and there's a lot of safeguards built into it there are bite commands in a 
specific language, it's, um, and it's a specific word in that language, and our, our master trainer trained it in such a way that it has to be delivered in their handler's voice. It, somebody could yell, bite them, sick them, get them. It doesn't do right. anything. But if that, the one, that one particular word in their master's voice <laughs> flips the switch for them. And we never, thank God, that never had to have anybody where they've had a bite incident and things. But they've been a great deterrent in um, having to have the physicality within the, the delivery of the security police services. So that's one thing I'm very proud of. And then, As you um, should be. Oh, thank you. And then uh, on the parking end, the one thing I'm very proud of is for is really being able to being able to always make it work somehow. Um, yeah. Sometimes you just you look at a problem and it's I don't know how I'm going to be able to do this or make this work, but then you end up figuring it out and making it work. And so I'm always proud of that. We're able to rise to the challenge and make it work. By instance, we moved our valet service from our main door at Presby Hospital, which is the flagship, because of construction-related activities. We we had to relocate it into the Presby garage. And boy, we put a lot of planning into it, put a lot of effort into that, six, seven months of planning. And then the day, the day came, it moved, and it was a fiasco. <laughs> the first two days were just horrible. And it reminded me of that old Mike Tyson saying, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> and, and then, man, we had to quickly regroup, recover. And then we did that on the second day, worked pretty much all night on different things we could do. And come the third day, we were able to institute it, those changes, and it's, it really smoothed everything out. And everything's working much much smoother, much better. The patients are much happier. Everything's working better now. I'm very proud of those, always being able to have those challenges think through it and then make it work. Yeah. Wow. Congratulations for that. Oh, again, great. I can hear the wheels turning in your head, which just again underscores why you've had such a, a successful and illustrious career at, at UPMC. Oh, thank you, Brian. So and I, and, I, and I, go I ahead. was just going to say, I, I do appreciate our partnership with Parker Technology. What your key in helping our patients have a frictionless experience not getting stuck anywhere. That's the last thing we want to have in healthcare. Somebody have we in parking. We we set the tone and tenor both on the exit and their departure for their visit. And our partnership helps that tremendously. Be positive for our patients, and we appreciate that. Yeah, you know, and I I appreciate you saying that. And we're we're just trying to deliver a great patient experience and a customer experience every time. Thank you for that. Welcome back to segment two of Harder Than It Looks, Parking Uncovered. I have two very special guests with me here today. I've got two CSRs that have, have taken quite a few calls for us. Sierra Arnett has been with us just under two years. Ryan Steifer has been with us just under a year. Ryan is out in Las Vegas in our call center in Las Vegas. Sierra is here in Indianapolis. And I've just got four or five questions that I'm going to ask them. But before that, what you should know is that Ryan, in less than a year, has taken 42,327 calls on our platform. That's a giant number. And Sierra, always near the top of our most productive CSRs, has taken 125,744 calls. And when you think about people that have heard it all and seen it all, I think I've got two of the best here from Parker. If I could, let me start with the first question. And Sierra, I'll go ahead and start with you. What do you think is the hardest thing about your job? Or what was the hardest thing about your job when you got started? And then what's the hardest thing about your job today? When I first started troubleshooting, it was probably the hardest part. I had to deal with a lot of upset customers, daily, angry, sad. And I just, let them out. Like I didn't troubleshoot at all. I was just like, okay, let me get you out. Cause I didn't want to, you know, keep them waiting, but I've learned it took me a while to get out of training. And now I think the hardest part is just the volume because it's so much <laughs> like it wasn't this much when I started Parker. Yeah. Like I used to struggle to get to 240 and now I'm hitting like 300 daily. Wow. So that's like the most challenging part to deal with. Wow. That's good. Okay. 
Ryan, how about you? What was the hardest thing when you started? And what do you think the hardest thing is now, today? For me, this was my first, actually my first call center that I ever had. Mm -hmm. So it was a big adjustment for me to just learn the software and be more customer friendly and be able to deal with the, the varied calls. So from one motorist, you know, might have a different emotions to the next motorist. Dealing with that and showing patience has really helped me to be successful and the, the best at doing my job. I norm, I, I mostly work at nighttime. So every, like I work twice, this is my morning day that I work. I work two mornings only in, in a month, but I know at nighttime, you just gotta be more, a little more detailed with your calls. Um, same thing with what Sierra said, you get a wide range of different, weird, outrageous calls and you just try to just troubleshoot them, like she said, and but just try to do your best to get the motorist out. They right. need to get up and going and get on with their lives. You don't want to be yeah. stuck in a parking garage all day. Yeah. So they're, they're under pressure. So here's what I can tell you. So Ryan at 42,000 calls, Sierra at 125,000. I have taken a hundred calls on the platform. Okay. <laughs> and job. let me just tell you, <laughs> that is a, it's a small number because it, it, what you do is, is special. What you can hear is. It takes critical thinking. You've got to, you've got to understand what's going on. You've got to think critically about the problem. And then you have to be able to figure out how best to move that call along all and all of that action and all of that, uh, that magic happens in under 60 seconds. So my, again, my hat is off to you, Sierra. I will tell you the hardest thing for me when I took those hundred calls was the listening. It, it was to listen and to understand the problem. So I already know that you both are awesome listeners. Because you have to listen and understand what the problem is. I can't tell you those poor motors that had to, that got me as a CSR. I probably asked them three times. So <laughs> what the problem was, it was, it, it was, it was not pretty. So you, you all have, you have hard jobs, which is exactly why you're on harder than it looks. Okay. So then the next question, just tell us a quick story about the most difficult customer you ever had. I'll start with Ryan this time and we'll come back to Sierra. It was probably. Maybe my third or fourth month. And all of a sudden I, I hop on this call and this guy was so irate. He just started cussing at me every four letters you could imagine. And all of a sudden he just started just getting really angry. He said he had to go through a divorce and I was trying to mm -hmm. calm him down. And he got so mad. He started throwing cash. He started okay. throwing dollar bills at the machine and. Okay. I was able to get off to that call and tell him, Hey, I don't appreciate your, your cussing at me and being aggressive. And he reversed his vehicle and I don't know where he went, but he stormed out. So that was mm. probably one of the, one of the worst calls I had. Wow. Yeah. That that's hard. To, it's, it's hard when people are upset and they're taking out all of their frustration on you for sure. So hats off to keeping your cool. It's one of the things we try and focus on. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Sierra, how about you? Tell us about your most difficult customer. I would say he wasn't really difficult. I think the situation was just difficult because I wanted to help him, but it was on a holiday. I can't remember if it was, I think it was like 4th of July and I was here and he was, he had, he only had cash and it was like a really strict garage where we couldn't bend them out at all. Yeah. And one of the payoff play stations wasn't working and I didn't know where the other one was. And I couldn't call out to anyone. Like I would call out the management. They weren't answering because it was holiday. They weren't on site. There was no attendance. And it was just really hard for me to try to get him out. Like I didn't know how to get him out. Yeah. So you said a couple of really important things. You were working on the 4th of July when some of our customers weren't, right? Yeah. We're, <laughs> we have the unenviable task of working every holiday, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But then you've got someone who's, again, trying to, they want to pay for parking, but they want to pay for it the way they want to pay for it and got rules to follow at the garage. And sometimes it, it can be challenging to, to direct them to the right place. So it's good that and a lot of times we need information about where the pay on foot stations are and all of that, and we can direct them back and, and get successful payment. Okay. So now let's turn the tables. Let's go Sierra with you on the best encounter you ever had or the best call you can recall? The best call was probably 
uh, motorists that only spoke Spanish. And at the time, it wasn't like a lot of people here that spoke Spanish. We didn't even have the call center in Vegas at the time. And I had to like Google Translate <laughs> some troubleshoot with the motorists. But like they appreciated that they knew where I was trying to help them. Yeah. So once the call was done, I was, I spoke a little bit of Spanish, I know, and I was able to at least get information to get them out. So they are really appreciative of that. That's awesome. Can you imagine walking or driving up to a machine where you barely speak the language? So yeah. now, you know, teleporting us to me to France mm-hmm. and you, you pull up and of course the operator speaking French and you're like, sorry, I, I don't speak French. Yeah. How intimidating <laughs> it is. It's already hard enough. And the fact that you went the extra mile to to try and translate it was that was awesome. And I think oh, that was probably before we had translation too. Yeah, you know, <laughs> now you can actually push a button and speak English, and the customer will hear Spanish if they've got if they've got our equipment in the lane or one of the other manufacturers that participates in that. So that's awesome. All right, Ryan, how about you? What was the best call you had? I've had a few, but I just remember one time this lady was. She kept putting, she was a hotel guest and she kept putting her key card in the credit card slot. And I was just, I was patient with her and she was really nice. And after the third time, um, she was able to look down there and say to tap her key card where it says overnight hotel guest tap key card. So, um, but she appreciated me because I was, you know, patient with her and, um, was kind and she appreciated that. I just told her next time nicely to just let me follow direction. You can get out a lot sooner. (laughs) Uh, I won't take the mic out of your hands at this point. I'll ask you, so if you could wave your magic wand and fix anything in parking or about your job, what, what would you do? Equipment issues for sure. Okay. So say a little bit more about that. We have one garage. It's just a mess. The payroll stations don't work. They can hear us at the exit. It's horrible. So I wish I could go there physically. Hey, get this fixed. <laughs> right. I can't do that. Right. I, I, not, I know that we've worked uh, a couple of times with that operator and try and clear it up. It's hard, right? Operate the environment in these garages is not perfect and the networks aren't yeah. perfect. And so sometimes it takes a little extra um to get things working. So mm-hmm. Ryan, how about your perspective on the magic wand? I would have two. Those parking machines are amazing. They're so great because you can, we can push validations. We can look up monthly parkers. You're able to pull a ticket, insert a credit card. I think that really helps us out a lot. Being able to have those. I know that it's, they're expensive machinery to have those for the, an investment for the garage, but in the long run, it cuts down on their workforce and us having to call them that too. And then also what Sierra was talking about earlier about the translation tool, that would be nice if other garages, we could advertise that translation tool, because then that will cut down on the other bilingual CSR. So they're not feeling overwhelmed with all these Spanish calls coming in. It'll right. release them with some stress where they can, they can be able to not feel like they're overwhelmed. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the magic wand is that everybody would put translation in their garages if it, if the equipment could support it. Yes. Yeah. And okay. there's a tool where you can, it, you have to click the customer's view, but it's only at certain garages and you can actually see what yep. the screen says. So I wish they all did that. I think that speaks to the more we get your perspective, the more we can build that kind of capability into the software, which then ultimately makes your job a little bit easier, but it also is a better result for the customer. So working in concert with your feedback and then all of the work that we're doing on our development side. So that's really good. Okay. So I'll leave you with uh, one more question. So Ryan, if there was one thing that you would want our customers to know about your job or how hard your job is or how easy or, or just something about your job, what would it be? Just how difficult at times it is, how there's a, there's a lot of notes that we have to follow. And a lot of the motorists say, can't you just open the gate? That's not that easy. We're trying to do our job and maximize the most amount of money to have the motorists pay for right. the garage because we're that middleman trying to you know, minimize the, I guess, amount of money that they, they wouldn't be receiving. Yeah. Um, but so. 
yeah. trying to minimize the amount of leakage, right? Leakage yeah. is, is the is the word. And our customers rely on us to, back to what Sierra said too, is to troubleshoot and ultimately have a successful payment. That's, it is particularly in the central business, business district. Now there are other places that are probably a little bit less focused on or more focused on customer service than they are on money. But yeah, just knowing how hard it is to sometimes be patient and walk these folks through to get a successful payment. Okay. Said, Sarah, what do you think? I want to say like we have really good CSRs and we have people who are training to be CSRs and they're like veterans in the company who are helping them and training them like the best they can be trained. And we're just making sure all the customers are taken care of at the end of the day. And they just have to be patient with us. And it can take a lot of stress off of the the garage managers because they don't have to get a whole bunch of calls like we're just following the notes and they're like unbothered. They really don't have anything to worry about. Yeah, that's great. So Ryan, did I cut you off? Did you have one more thing to add about your job? No, I was going to say too, what Sierra was talking about, the managers, I think they deserve a lot of credit. The supervisors, Mona from the, from scratch, she's built this Las Vegas call center by just herself on just her personality and just the way that she drives the ship, you know, and with, with, with those managers, it's because I've seen it, I've seen employees come and go, and it's a tremendous amount of patience that the managers, the supervisors, they have to have. But it's a constant training. We're all training. We're all learning, but especially right. the ones that are starting off, they get, when they're training someone, you can just tell they're just at the end of their shift, they're exhausted, ready to just go home and just, right. you know, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, hard. <laughs> it's hard and we know we, we've grown fast and to your credit, you may not hear this as, as often as we should be telling you, our customers by and large have not felt our growth. And so again, that is really hats off to you all you and your colleagues that are CSRs as well for uh, absorbing that growth and for continuing to be the professionals that you are. I think you've done a great job here in this little segment as a short segment, just to, to highlight how hard the job is and how exhausting it is at times, but it can also be good. It can be exhilarating when you finally get a successful payment, you get somebody that where the light bulb clicks and they're like, oh yeah, I'm using my room key instead of a credit card. I got it. Um, yeah, they usually apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, I'm like, it's <laughs> right. And so it's a hard job and it's, and it's something that requires critical thinking and you've got to, you got to have perseverance and persistence and all of that. And thank you for representing our ranks well, and for representing the work. Our customers, I, I, we want our customers to appreciate the job that it is. It's hard, but that we're focused on all of us. It's frontline. It's supervisors, it's managers all the way to the top, including me. Uh, we're focused on making sure that our people have a good environment to work in, but that they're ultimately our customers are happy with the service we deliver. Okay, that's a wrap on this episode of Harder Than It Looks, Parking Uncovered, presented by Parker Technology. Please leave us a review if you liked what you heard. Make sure you tune in next month as we continue to uncover tips, tricks, and best practices to manage what we all know is harder than it looks, parking a car. Bye for now.